from Tally to Cali. It's time to wake up. Wake up, wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Zaxby's. Now here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hudjavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! Freaked you out with that little yeah, Corey. <laughs> well, we're double dipping today, man. Always weird on video. It's always, always weird, weird for the, to see the wake up on video. So if you're watching this on video, it's just a normal stand-up. It's a post-game wrap-up. Him and uh, I usually do these after football games. But we're at basketball school now here at Florida State, so we're doing a video wrap-up. And this is also uh, the beginning of the podcast on your Tuesday. Uh, it's Wake Up War Chance, presented by Zaxby's. Uh, by the way, Mike Myrick, fan of the program, on YouTube says, Aslan, that sandwich is delicious. He's okay. talking about the Caribbean jerk sandwich that I talked about on the Monday program, which got a nice little balance and of if, sweetness and tang. If Mike Myrick is vouch- vouching for it, then you know he ain't lying to you. <laughs> Come on. M Squared ain't going to lie to you. What else if it's you good, it's, he'll tell you. Uh, we work for Warchant.com, obviously. Use the promo code Warchant30. If you're not a member, to get better insight uh, from him and Ira. They save the good stuff for the people who pay. It's just a natural thing. It's called capitalism, everybody. Hop aboard. Let's do it. November 2020, let your voice be heard. All right. Anyhow, people here in Tallahassee let their voice be heard mm-hmm. uh, really Ooh, loudly on Monday night. Good segue. Night. Thanks. I'm getting a little bit better at this. Trying. Yeah, that was, uh, pro. that was a pro move right there. 82-67 to 67 win over Louisville. Uh, the coaches put them top 10, so we'll say a win over top 10 Louisville. Uh, it's been the question that you've asked coaches, players, uh, fans that have been walking by here before we went on air. Uh, this place was absolutely electric on Monday night. I mean, uh, where does it rank in terms of what you've experienced here at uh, the TLCC? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, uh, you know, I've been here for 12 years covering this program. I think last year's Duke game with Zion and everything, all the hype that came in with that. You had an Elite Eight team in Florida State. With, I think that was their second ACC game of the year and uh, both ranked in the top 15 or so. Duke was number one. I thought consistently that might have been louder than this because Florida State didn't get off to a good start. And they were down by eight at half. They were down by 12 in the first half at one point. They are down by 11 with 15 minutes to go. But the last, let's say 12 minutes, was about as loud as a sustained 12 minutes as I've ever felt in this place. And in particular, the two plays, the Patrick Williams dunk, um, I think that put them up by seven. They'd come all the way back and now they're up by seven or eight. That, I'm telling you, I know the Trent Ford's dunk was more spectacular in an all-time great highlight, and they'll be showing that clip in this building for the next five decades, but that Patrick Williams dunk almost blew the roof off this place. I mean, it was ear-splitting. Like, literally, it felt like being in the swamp, where, like, you almost have to cover your ears. That's I mean, how loud why? it was. I mean, come on. Any sorry. other place? Uh, sorry. Like being a doke in the 90s. <laughs> <Sorry. Okay. laughs> like being in the, like being doke in the 90s. It was so <laughs> loud, man. It was like the Rashad Green touchdown against Oklahoma. Okay. It yes. was. It was. Yes. There you go. That's a good oh. one, right? They still lost oh. that game, though. I wish it's I could. Okay. Notre Dame, the offensive pass interference All on right. Notre Dame. We'll take that. Um, I, I've never heard it that loud. I've never, for one one uh, moment, I've never heard it as loud as that. It was incredible. I didn't, I didn't know this place. This place is a loud place when people are into it, mm-hmm. and that's as loud as I think it's as loud as this place has ever been. And then the Forest Dunk was just an unbelievable all-time highlight for a unbelievable all-time Seminole. I was, I know it's not his senior day. He's got one more against Boston College, but for all intents and purposes, that was his moment. And it's really cool he got to have something like that. Did you know the whole way he was going to go for the flush? I'm like, he's going to probably do a layup, you know, when he got kind of to the top of the key. I'm like, all right, he's going to go for the layup and get the foul maybe. No. And, uh, you know, we talked to him. We just talked to him after the game. And he said that in that moment, you always want to go to – you want to try to go for the dunk. You and I know that. Like, Obviously. if it's late in the game, yeah. they're a little tired. You go – you rise up and try to dunk it on him. Listen up, Brady. Yeah, you try to hammer that on him, Brady. I know right now you can't jump over a piece of paper, but it's coming. Um Yes, I was surprised. I thought it was going to be, I thought it was going to be probably a hard foul and he's shooting two free throws. He went up and just hammered it over a kid who's a very good player, yeah. will be in the NBA. And two years ago when Louisville played here and lost in overtime, Nwora had two dunks over, he had, he had one over Cabin Gully, mm-hmm. maybe two over Cabin Gully. That might have been last year. Yeah. Anyway, um, I mean, he had some vicious dunks here in this building two years, or two years ago or a year ago, whenever that was. And then he got a taste of his own medicine because that was an all time flush by Forrest over a really good player. Right. So again, 82 to 67 win. They're now 14 and three in conference play. You mentioned on the show on Monday, basically a win like here pretty much locks up your floor. Yeah. It's hard to imagine this team not starting off in Tampa, uh, becoming a, a top four seed. What I mean, what do they further showcase in this game that that, that you don't that you didn't know before this game, or what did it reinforce that just made you feel so optimistic about this team and their chances? Man, it's hard. They want another way. They want a different way. Like we were, I just talked about yesterday how. It looked like 
in big games, Leonard had found his five or six and was going to roll with them. No, uh -uh. Trent Forrest was, when they made their run, Trent Forrest was on the bench. Yeah. You got huge contributions from Raekwon Evans during that run. Um, Dominic Olechinichek. Olechinichek. I, I, sorry, I, I can't even spell it, much well, less hey, pronounce it. I'm still it. calling him Dominique. Well, I I'm yeah, Dominique Magnifique. <laughs> So uh, you got you got a big you got big moments from him and Dom. Um, Polite had some pretty good minutes. Polite had yeah. some really big moments defensively and offensively. Knocked down some big threes. Had a nice take uh, to the basket. So it was completely different than the NC State game. It's like they the NC State game they played five guys essentially the whole second half. And this one they played nine. In they I mean they, I think they played fourteen because they put in the walk ons. But they played nine that really contributed in the second half. And they just again they come at you in waves. And that to me was uh, again it just shows that they can win a number of different ways and then i was completely wrong yesterday when i talked about how it looked like he was going to in big games that mattered he might stick and shorten the rotation no man the fact that he lengthened the rotation i think is how trent forrest is dunking on a kid with two minutes left he had all the he had fresh legs he had sat out i don't i don't think trent forrest has sat out meaningful minutes in the second half like from 10 minutes on to zero in maybe two and a half years. Like he always is on the court for those final eight to 10 minutes. And Raekwon Evans played so well and yeah. kind of sparked that rally that he could get some he could get some rest. So could Devin Vassell. So yeah, polite Raekwon Evans and Dom gave them huge minutes off the bench. And then Raekwon Gray came in and, and was really big uh, down the stretch too, hitting free throws and grabbing rebounds and blocking shots. Huge win, man. I mean, it's really, it's hard to, to overstate just uh, how big of a win it was and just uh, what the kind of moment was here uh, tonight just to experience and it. I'm, and I'm going to write about it by the time you're listening to this. Um, are we putting this video up right away? Yeah. Okay, well, so hold, you've seen this video. Hold on for a few hours, and then you'll get to read the story. But I'm kind of writing about how it felt like um, it was just so, it's such a cool moment for what Leonard's built. It was the combination. It was the confluence of a really a, a team that you'd really like to cheer for because they're they play hard and they're selfless a huge game one of the biggest in this arena's history um something to play for in late february all coming together and then that moment with patrick williams and that moment with trent forrest it's like i asked them afterwards like could you allow yourself we remember when he took over were you a student here when he took over you know yeah. you were I you mean, it was, that was in the midst of it yeah but you yeah. weren't here when he was hired in 2000 no, no, right no, no, no. but you came shortly thereafter and there were some down years man some really down years and even when they had good years this place would be half full sometimes so i asked him if in the moment he could he could just appreciate this place being full and this place sounding like cameron louder than cameron i've been to cameron now, i haven't been there for a carolina game but i've been to cameron it was louder than cameron's ever been and I, when i've been there and he said, he said, no, man. He's like, I, you know, he goes, I've done all this. I've won a championship. I've been to a Final Four. None of these guys have. So I'm not going to allow myself to feel satisfied that we have won a big game with a big crowd. He goes, the cake's still in the oven. So maybe after the season, he can look back and maybe see a, I don't know, you know those pictures they have of the, the, the long pictures that you can put in your office? Panoramas. The, yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe they do something from this game and he can like, man. They I'd, did. They did. They, sh they shot their like a, an amazing sellout tonight in Tallahassee. It was crazy. Oh, there you go. Just, uh, like a fisheye shot. There you from, go. Uh, so the you, you hope that maybe he can put that in his office and one day appreciate what he built in that moment because it was the culmination of 20 years of work, really. Um, but yeah, he's like, no, no, he I guess that's why I'm who I am and that's why he is who he is. I think like that, he thinks about the next game. He's thinking about Clemson. So, um, but yeah, I just thought it was an all time great moment for him and for this program. And uh, what a comeback. I mean, they, the last 15 minutes, they outscored him 41 to 16. And that's a team, now look, they could lose in the second round, Louisville. They could also get to the final four. I mean, they are supremely talented. And the, the Malik Williams kid who got hurt, who's a big part of their team, uh, it's supposedly going to be okay. It was a sprained ankle. It wasn't anything, uh, or twisted ankle. It wasn't anything severe. Hey, last thing for me, I mean, to kind of go back to your point about just Leonard being so focused and, and worrying about the next game, that's what coaches do, but I, he'll never say it. I mean, how, how much of it do you think it's because of what happened last season and, and just what he thinks he has this season? And he really does believe that he has a national championship caliber program and, and a team at least this season. Yeah, I think that, but I, I don't, yeah, it's a program. It's not just a team. I think that he has this thing at a point now, you know, they had the number one or number two point guard in the country right, yeah. in the 2021 class. Um, ooh, the name was there on the tip of my tongue, and now it's not that. I want to say Chandler Kennedy, but that's Chandler, completely. So I'm going to look it up. You're going to look it up on I'm video. That's what video. we do. That's okay. what we. I'll talk while he looks IT it up. Department doing. Um, so they had him on campus. You know, they had one of their junior their junior college signee from this past uh, in this class right now. Uh, Sadar Calhoun scored 50 points in his latest JUCO game and hit like nine threes. 
Bryce McGowans, who's also a part of the 2021 class, just scored 65 in a playoff win in South Carolina. He's starting to get along with Scotty Barnes, who's coming in this next year, maybe Vassell and Williams stay. He's looked at this program now and he sees, you know, four or five years ago or 10 years ago with Tony Douglas, you're like, okay, maybe we get lucky and there's yeah. a chance. Now he sees sustained success and he's like, yeah, yeah, it's great that we're 24 and four and we're selling this place out. We can get to the mountaintop. He's, he's got a program built now. Now it's all March, so it's all one-offs and you could get unlucky in March, but he's got a, he, he should have a high seed and he should be playing close to home, which are always help. You know, you always wonder why Duke and Carolina, when Carolina's good, why they get to the Sweet 16 almost every year. Well, it's because they play their first two games in front of 9,000 of their own fans, Greensboro, their home or, games. Yeah. Florida State's never really gotten a chance to do that other than maybe three years ago in Orlando, where it's still, they had to play Florida Gulf Coast and Florida was in the same pod. So there were a lot of people in the building cheering against Florida State. Losers. Don't think that'll be the case this year. I think he's gonna have a home court advantage in Tampa for the NCAA tournament. And I, I think that he thinks that, okay, this could be one of those seasons. This could be another special season. It's already been kind of special, man. But, I, and I know I'm you know, yammering not, on and not, on. Nah, man. But when you think about what they lost, in, in six really good players, two, two NBA draft picks, but six guys that really contributed were big time program players. And then you come in and you're better. You're better somehow. You're 24 and four and 14 and three in the conference um, is, is just number six in the country. It's, it's incredible. I, I, I'm astounded by how good they are. And I'm also astounded by what this crowd was like uh, on Monday night. It was incredible. It's just a great, great atmosphere. Do you want to give one final crack at the recruit who is uh, in attendance? So it's not Chandler Kennedy. Is it Kennedy Chandler? Bingo. Is that it? It's Kennedy oh, Chandler. There we go. Kennedy. Guy. All right. Look there you go. Guy. This guy. Kennedy. There, I don't think there's ever been a good basketball player with the first name. Has there ever been an athlete with the name Kennedy? I can't think of one. You can't of think one. of one off the top of your I head, can you? One. People are probably yelling at us right now. Duh, Kennedy. I don't know. I feel pretty good. I feel pretty so, good about this one that there hasn't been one. So he right. could be, I mean, we could see some history here. Right. Twitter feed will be nice and clean. No one will be uh, correct. And I want to say this Kennedy, if you're watching this, which I assume you are, if you don't commit, after this game, what, then you weren't ever going to commit. Like this couldn't have been um, a better game to come to as a Florida State recruit. Holy moly, man. It was just an incredible uh, atmosphere. So yeah, when you talk about the floor, I think that's the floor now is that I, I just have to imagine they're guaranteed of being a, a top four seed in the NCAA tournament now, which gets them to Tampa, which is a huge deal. But you also kind of shift your attention after this win. All right, if they went out, they're at Clemson on Saturday, they're at Notre Dame uh, two or three days later, and then they host Boston College. At Clemson, at Notre Dame, those are uh, maybe not coin flips, but those are tough to win. You, you gotta assume you're gonna beat Boston College. But if you win out and Duke loses, they only have really one tough game left and it's at Virginia, but that's a tough game. They got if, Carolina, Carolina might try to play on, spoiler. Come on, not at Duke, they're gonna lose by 100. Um, I, Florida State could win the league regular season title. And that's what I'm saying, that's what I think Leonard is focused on now. You don't, you don't know how many chances you get with like this at a place like Florida State. As good as they've been in the past, they've never really had a realistic chance to win the league a uh, regular season title. They do now. And so, you know, I, I think he really is gonna embrace this moment and try to get his kids to embrace this moment. Be like, go get it. Go, cha go, go to Clemson and play hungrier than them. You're trying to win, you're trying to make history. They might be trying to get in the NCAA tournament. You're trying to make, I don't think they can do that. Notre Dame can. But they're trying to get into the NCAA tournaments and get marquee wins. You're trying to make history. So go go match their hunger. And Leonard said that after the game, right? He said he didn't want Louisville to be to want it more than his team right. did. And they didn't. Uh, Louisville kind of uh, melted down there in the final 10 minutes. Yeah, Florida State did it to him. I think Jay Billis on the telecast said that they were breathing fire on defense. So Man, they it's, melted it, them. And Chris Mack said that after the game. He's like, he goes, I, I think this, this is a direct quote. He goes, I've watched a lot of film. Obviously, he's a basketball coach. It'd be weird if he hadn't. <laughs> He's like, I've seen a couple of clips here and there. They look like they, who's the four kid? What is that, is he a freshman? He goes, I've watched a lot of film. Nobody runs their offense against Florida State, nobody. And that's, that's not the first time we've heard that. They make it so hard for you to do things. Now Louisville in the first half exploited some things, got to the lane, made some, made some uh, Crazy layups. Crazy three-pointers, I think. And, then, and also the McMahon was, yeah. was, uh, wasn't even hitting rim on his threes in the first half. And they got some good looks in the second half that they missed. But that's what happens on the road. Number one, your legs get tired because you're, you're playing 38 minutes where these guys keep running in and out. But when the crowd gets into the game and it's so loud, man, you just tense up a little bit. It's just a, it shouldn't be. The rim's still the same. It's still 10 feet high. It's that Hoosier scene. Um, you know, it's, it's still 10 feet tall, but it just, it's hard. The, the, the rim shrinks when the place is going that nuts. And you could tell at the end, um, they, were just, they were just done. They were just done. And that's a, that's a, 
it's a really cool moment for this program uh, in those guys, and Trent Forrest in particular. That was really, really neat for him to have that moment. Uh, this video is done, but the show is not done. Uh, Irish O'Fell sat down with John Papuchis, uh, your defensive ends coach if you're a Florida State football Irish fan. Irish getting some work. I know, He's doing man. some work for Wake Up War Champ. Yeah, so uh, that's going to play right after this. But if you're watching the video, thanks for watching. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, keep it here. You know, looking at the coaches' bios and talking to you guys, so many of the assistant coaches on the staff kind of came up really – from humble beginnings in coaching, you know, guys, you know, really work their way up, and, and you're certainly one of them. Uh, in some of your first jobs where you're basically maybe cost of living, if you work it out by the hour, you're probably making less than minimum wage. What was that like, and how did you, um, I guess, what was the decision to, how passionate were you to, to make that decision? Well, you know, that's so why I was a GA or an intern for seven years. Um, and, you know, it started out at the University of Kansas. Uh, where I went as a graduate assistant, and that was my first college opportunity, and uh, you know, I I didn't know what to think of it. You know, I wanted to give it a shot, and I, I said to myself, you know, if I can really make this thing work, then this is what I would love to do for my career. But I also went into it with a you know open-ended view of if if it doesn't work out, I will be able to at least get my master's degree and and lay a groundwork for a career path in a different direction. So. Um, I went there, uh, loved it, you know, which I knew I would, um, you know, saw what the lifestyle of, of coaching would be like, and I decided it was what I wanted to do. I probably came to a critical decision point after my third year at Kansas. I had gotten my master's, and uh, I could no longer be eligible to be a grad assistant anymore. And I got offered a full-time job at Eastern Illinois. Uh, where I was going to help, I was in coach of safeties there, and it's back when they had what they called uh, restricted earnings positions in, in um, the one double A level, and it wasn't going to pay a whole lot of money. It was it was maybe twenty thousand dollars, and I had an opportunity to be a quality control coach at LSU, and go there when Coach Saban was the head coach, and his staff was full of you know young up and coming coaches. I mean, Will Muschamp was defense coordinator, Kirby Smart. Uh, coached the secondary. Jimbo Fisher was the offensive coordinator. Um, Derek Dooley coached the running backs. And, you know, so it was kind of that decision point of do I go and take my first full time position job or do I continue to, to go this route of being a quality control coach but know the relationships that I develop and um, the knowledge that I gain from going with these guys at LSU would be worth it. So I, I obviously I went the LSU route and um, you know I couldn't have made a, a better decision in hindsight. I was only with Coach Saban for a year, uh, but then Coach Miles and his staff came in, and that's where I connected with Bo Pelini and really started getting my career kind of set on a, on a much different trajectory. How did you um, get the first job? Like, how did you get the job at Kansas? <laughs> that, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and it's a long story that I'll make abbreviated. Okay. So um, I was coaching high school football in Virginia, and I wanted to get into college coaching as a career path. If I was going to do career coaching, I wanted to be either college or pros, and where it was really what your main focus was, as opposed to, you know, I didn't have any real desire to be within the school system, you know, to mm -hmm. teach and coach. I wanted to, that the coaching to be my my profession. So um, I didn't know how else to do it. So essentially, I sent out letters and resumes you know old school in the post you know like like through the postage like letters to to coaches and i did it all over the country i started from east to west you know division one division two one double a you know all the way d3 didn't matter to me i just wanted to get my foot in the door so i i mean hundreds and i have wow. copies of all these letters on a floppy disk somewhere and um, you know, in my storage, but uh, I think it ended up being like 380 letters that wow. I ended up sending out and uh, got a lot of letters back, mostly from HR departments saying, thanks, we got your information, but no thanks. Really nothing was coming from it. And uh, I was about three or four months into this process. And I remember coming home one day and uh, my roommate, um, it was before, you know, we had cell phones, and everything else said that, uh, that there was a message on the answering machine for me from uh, from a uh, a coach at the University of Kansas. And to be honest with you, I didn't believe him. I thought he was just kind of pulling my leg because he had known that I've been waiting for this. And uh, you know, sure enough, there, there was. And he was a new defensive coordinator on staff. His name was Tom Hayes. And uh, when he came in, he wanted to kind of uh, you know 
clear out anybody that had been there previous and kind of start over. So he brought in a brand new defensive staff, including whoever he was going to bring in as gra graduate assistant. And uh, you know, I've, I, they they told me they got like thousands of letters and resumes and applicants for this job, and uh, I ended up getting it. The reason I got it though was it's kind of actually funny. Um, the director of operations was the one who was in charge of going through all the letters and uh he picked out 10 guys that he thought were just phenomenal guys mm -hmm. who would played in the nfl had high school coaches and won state championships big time college players that wanted to get into coaching all that stuff and he brought the defense coordinator these resumes and he went through these resumes and said no 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 that's not what i'm looking for these guys have already kind of achieved greatness in their career I, i'm not looking for that i'm looking for young hungry guys that um, are looking to, to just get their foot in the door and do whatever they can do. And it kind of made the director of ops mad because he had spent a lot of time trying to pick out the 10. So he went back through it and essentially brought him 10 more names, and I was in that pile. And later, after I'd been there a while, he told me the truth was, I said, well, how'd you pick my, 10 name, you know, my name out of the 10 names in that second stack? And he said... Yeah, I went back through because I was so upset about it, and I picked the 10 least qualified people for the job, <laughs> and you were in that stack. So, well, awesome. hey, God had a plan for me. I, you know, Obviously, <laughs> somehow my name got to the top of that least qualified stack, and now we're here talking about it. So that's, that's kind of how that's that all great, went down. That's a great story. So you, uh, how hungry were you when you got that opportunity? I mean, like you must have been just, I'll do anything. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was... I was coaching, you know, small 2A high school football in Virginia, and all of a sudden, within the span of a week, um, you know, of gathering my belongings and getting in my Pontiac Sunbird and driving to Kansas from Virginia, um, all of a sudden now I walk in and they were getting ready in their off-season game planning for UCLA, and I'm just sitting there looking like, oh my God, like how did I get here? And then, yeah, to, to your point, I just wanted to do whatever I could do to stay. You know, mm -hmm. I felt like... Um, you know, I got to be the first one to be there in the morning, the last one to leave at night. Um, just kind of that that blue collar work ethic, which it speaks to what he wanted. I mean, that's why he wanted that type of person as a as a graduate assistant that um, was really hungry for the opportunity to be there. Were you as a young kid playing sports? Were you sure. thinking coaching is something you wanted to do, or did that come later? So it was interesting. So um, I grew up a diehard Redskins fan. Um, and loved football. I loved everything about football. I loved the camaraderie. I loved the hard work. I loved the two a days. That I, something about it, I just always, always loved. And uh, but I was a really pretty good baseball player. I mean, that was probably the like the the sport I was more talented at. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved that too. But it was different. You know, just being on the team is different, and it's a lot more individual and all that that stuff. And probably when I was about 18 years old, I decided that I wanted to be a football coach. And going back to me mentioning I was a diehard wrestling fan, Joe Gibbs was my absolute, like, I thought he was the, the greatest, you know, coach and leader and all that. So I was like, if I, I just want to be like him. And, I, and the summer going into my freshman year of college, I read his first biography, which was Fourth and One, I think it was what it was titled. And from that point forward, I was like, at that that's what I want to do. I want to be a, I want to be a football coach and, uh, you know, kind of geared everything in that direction from that point on. Mm. When you, uh, when you go to LSU and, and you, as you mentioned that staff, uh, you know, the stories of working for coach Saban are kind of legendary. Was that a, a bit of a culture shock in terms of just kind of the way things are run there? Or was it similar to where you'd been before? Uh, I think it was a culture shock for me from the standpoint of being at a place that was having great success. Uh, I was three years at the University of Kansas. One of them, the head coach, was Terry Allen. Uh, that staff ended up getting let go. I was fortunate enough to stay. Uh, and then I was with Coach Mangino for two years, uh, the last of which we did go 6-6 six and six and had started to make some progress uh, heading towards the bowl. But I had not been at a place. Uh, LSU was coming off a national championship. So that like that coming into that environment and and uh, the expectations and the high stakes game environment was much different for me than Kansas was so it was different from that perspective the work wasn't all that different you know uh, it was you work no harder you know at LSU than you did at Kansas but you were surrounded by you know some really really great coaches and um, you knew that the stakes were a little bit higher every week that you went out to play 
And you could you tell that how many of those guys were going to end up being head coaches? I mean, like you said, they all basically all of them end up becoming. Yeah, head coaches. I mean, you know, you could tell like, like there was a special group. I mean, obviously they're all smart, and and obviously success. Um, leads to opportunity so the more we won and then coach Saban going to the Dolphins and you know a lot of those guys going with him on staff you could tell like their career paths they're all young coaches they were all had dynamic personalities you could tell that that group of guys was was headed for for a lot of success in their future and then what was how did you connect with coach Pelini I mean was there a personal connection or what what how did you kind of win his favor because he obviously took you with him and respected you. Yeah, no, so it, it started early on. Um, you know, when he came to LSU, uh, his family didn't make the move immediately, like a lot of us, you know, when we transitioned. Um, so they were going to finish their academic school year. So I, his family didn't move to like June 1st-ish of, of that first year. But he came in January. At the time, uh, my wife, who, at the, who was then my girlfriend, she had not moved to Baton Rouge yet either. So... In the evening, when when most of the guys had already gone home and you know had shut shut it down for the day, um, he always just stayed up there and, and watched film and, and um, spent time you know working on football things, and it was really a good opportunity for me because I didn't have anywhere else to go. I would just sit there and pick his brain and, and hang out with him and listen and um, try to learn as much as I could. So that four or five months where we were together like and and being able to spend time you know in the evenings when it was quiet and no one else was there and him just he loves teaching like he loved teaching me just like he loved teaching players Mm -hmm. um so like that was kind of the foundation of of everything going forward and you know we were together three years uh there and and obviously had a lot of success each year we were in the top three in the country in defense and won the national championship in 2007 and you know, I like to think that that I played a role in in his success there as his graduate assistant or his intern, however mm-hmm. they named the job title back then. But um, so I think that's what really ultimately led me going to Nebraska. And then when you go to Nebraska, you go as a position coach, but then later get promoted a couple times. You end up a defensive coordinator. That's like ten years or eleven years after you were got to yeah. Kansas as a GA. How surreal was that? You're a defensive coordinator at Nebraska. Yeah, no, that was that was kind of crazy because in in two thousand. Five, six, that time frame, you know, about one or two years in LSU. I'd been in GA at that point for five years, and I was thinking to myself, I just, I don't know if this is really going to work out. And I was kind of in that, you know, career crisis, panic mm-hmm. mode. Am I doing the right thing? And, you know, five or six years later, I ended up having the opportunity to be the defense coordinator. So it all worked out. So, yes, it was, it was surreal. But I also, that was, it, it probably was more surprising to people on the outside than it ever was to me. You know, because that was kind of the plan and, and the goal, and you know, you don't always have control of that. But you know, it didn't shock me when it happened. But I think, like, to family and friends and you know, coworkers, there was. You know, I was 34 years old at the time. I was the youngest um, defensive coordinator, I think, at FBS or or whatever. But um, you know, so I think there were were a lot of people that were surprised about it. But um, I felt like you know, it was something I was ready to do. Having been a defense coordinator and then going back to being a position coach, it. Carolina, Maryland, and now here. What um, and you've been back and forth, coordinator, position coach, and back. Sure. What uh, do you approach things differently? Is it a different mindset, or do you, or do you still look at it like uh, like what you would do is in charge, or do you focus just on your position? How do you how do you guys do that? Um, well, I, you know, for for one, I mean, I've learned a lot. You know, being able to coach a lot of different positions and having different titles. Um, I think I'm a better position coach now for having been a coordinator. Mm-hmm. One is I understand what it feels like now to sit in that seat. So, you know, there are certain things that a defense coordinator goes to bed worried about at night. And the one thing I'm going to take off of his plate is that he's worried about anything going on at my position. Um, so I've always kind of thought, okay, if I'm not the defense coordinator, then I'm going to be the defense coordinator of my position group. So whether I was coaching linebackers or now defensive ends, that I'm going to keep as many things off of his plate to worry about than I possibly can. Um, because you know people forget you know as as you work your way up the ladder and your responsibility gets greater your concerns also become Mm -hmm. bigger you know so you know when I watch a play as a defensive coordinator I have 11 people I'm worried about all doing the right thing whereas a position coach you might have two or three so you know one position group might do a great job on a given play and another one doesn't Mm -hmm. and as a coordinator that's just you don't feel good about things ever because 
it's never perfect, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So I want to try to make my position group as perfect as I possibly can so at least he doesn't have to worry about my spot. Mm -hmm. um, and it's made me a better coach and it's made me a better teacher. I, I probably teach a little bit more big picture now than I, I used to. Uh, and I think that's good for the players. I think when they understand um, you know, how their role fits in the big picture of the defense better, it helps them do their job. And then you also will be doing special teams. Yes. Uh, when did, what was the, how did you get into special teams coaching? Uh, did, you, did you kick or anything like that or, or did you <laughs> yeah, I fall into a, it? I kicked a little bit. Um, but um, really I, I kind of, I fell into that a little bit at Nebraska. Uh, when Coach Pelini took the, the head job there, uh, he had a great plan you know, of what he wanted to do, but what he didn't really have a plan on was how he wanted to uh, allocate the different responsibilities in terms of special teams. And every time you go in there as a new staff, um, you know, there's a lot of things that are in transition. And I felt like one of the ways I could help him out the most was to take that burden responsibility off of, of his plate, uh, so to speak. So um, without being asked to do it, I kind of organized a spring install schedule for the special teams, um, kind of organized who would be responsible for coaching the different things, um, how we were going to install it and implement it. And I just presented it to him and he was like, why don't you just be the special teams coordinator? And I was like, <laughs> Okay, you know, yeah. I, we'll do it. And in year one of doing that, there was a lot of trial by fire. I mean, it was it was a lot of learning as we went. And then um, by the second and third year, I had back-to-back -back all American kickers. We were like one of the top ranked special teams units in the country in 2009 and 10. Um, so it, it was it was good. I mean, it was a uh, it was a, a really worthwhile experience. And um, I felt like the more things you can do in this profession, the more likely you are to stay employed, right? <laughs> so um, when we got let go off of, of uh, the staff at North Carolina, when you know the whole staff got let go uh, under Coach Fedora, I got two calls within the first day or two, and both of them were come coach my linebackers and coordinate my special teams, which was a little surprising to me because I hadn't really coordinated special teams in six or seven years. But both coaches that offer those opportunities presented like, hey, if I can get you as a guy who's been a defensive coordinator and coordinate my special teams, I've kind of gotten value from mm -hmm. that, um, which you know I didn't, had never really thought of it that way, but I'm, I'm glad it all played out. And Coach Norvell obviously has a, places a huge priority on special teams. Did, you, did he communicate that to you, or did you know that kind of about him and having seen Memphis? Or, well, I knew Memphis was really good yeah. uh, because I was actually was, um, for – one of the stats that I've always used, you know, I'm not a huge stat guy because all stats can be deceiving, but they are a metric and they are a measuring stick, right? So one of the one of the ones that we used was always the team efficiency uh, statistic that you get on ESPN, right? It's one of the ones that talk about how your unit impacts scoring differential and scoring. And at Maryland, we were either one or we were first and Memphis was second or we were second and Memphis was first for like the first eight or nine weeks of the season. We ended up having a, a bad game against Michigan, which kind of knocked us down at Maryland a little bit to the top 10 or so. But for most of the season, and I, I just kept noticing that like Memphis, Memphis was always there. And they, their special teams coordinator had been at Maryland, so there was a lot of ties um, from that perspective. So anyway, I just, I would, to answer your question in a long-winded version, I was aware they were really good. I had no idea that he placed the emphasis that he does on it. Um, I didn't know him that well, but I knew that they were really good. And then last thing, just uh, what's it been like so far getting to know the staff? I mean, you probably didn't know. I don't know how many of you knew at all before you came in. I, I didn't know any of them. Wow. It was kind of, you know, like uh, it's it's unique. Um, you know, I don't think I had really even – I'm trying to think. I don't think I'd met anybody that was on the staff even. Um, but uh, I think it speaks to the quality of men that are on the staff. Um, after I was here three or four days, I felt like I had known them my whole life, right? So um, that ability to be comfortable with people and, and you know, that that's not a coincidence. I mean, he, you know, Coach Norvell hired a staff of really great football coaches, great teachers, but also really good people. And, uh, you know, I've, I've enjoyed every minute of being around these guys. And, um, you know, I'm, 
I think we have a, a good group here and, and a good thing going. Awesome. I appreciate it. Zaxby's Caribbean Jerk Chicken is just like a vacation in the tropics, only without the sunburn oh! or the dive-bombing seagulls ah! or all of that pesky sand. How did it get in there? Well, at least it tastes like the tropics. Enjoy our famous chicken tossed in a tropical blend of spicy habanero, fruity mango, and exotic island spices. The Caribbean Jerk Boneless Wings and the new Filet Sandwich Meal. Two more reasons you'll get a kick out of Zaxby's.